I, if you are listening on Spotify or Apple Music, I recommend you go to YouTube so you can see what I look like. Um, <laughs> otherwise, that giant woohoo isn't going to make a lot of sense. Um, welcome back to the Shift Gear podcast. Uh, I look a little different today. It is, uh, or it was Halloween weekend um, and Halloween last week, and we forgot to dress up, didn't we? Yeah, last week's episode was kind of boring. We should have done it now it feels like so late but i appreciate your commitment uh to just the halloween festivities i feel bad that i'm not dressed up my costume is i actually i don't know if it's you've seen the camera i have my ash ketchum costume back there i was ash very fitting for my halloween party uh, um, that is very fitting yes. i had like uh three different costumes this year this was actually my last year costume but it's the best one to wear on shift gear because like <laughs> bro who else is a fall guy <laughs> uh yo it's actually a full body too i'm gonna give you all a little twirl so look at this all the way around Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Full body fall I guys costume. <laughs> I am serious. Um, so welcome back to the Shift Gear Podcast. Uh, if you were with us last week, we had an episode with Mike uh, about some rogue decks. If that's not your cup of tea, we suggest you check it out anyways because it might end up being your cup of tea. Uh, it's one of those one of those things where I feel like old format pe or old format people are such a niche, right? And uh, it's uh, I don't know. Sometimes, like newer format players, don't really care too much for it, but we do recommend it. Give it a shot. Uh, try old formats in general. I think is is our uh, mentality always. I think you learn a lot about the modern game as well. So that's kind of where we were last week. Uh, we're gonna jump back into regular scheduled content now. Here uh, we had Donsk regionals that happened over the weekend. We want to discuss TCG Pocket. This is a very uh, hot topic right now. <laughs> As well as uh, we got some Evolution cards revealed, and uh, we'll look over some Surging Sparks results as well. So, uh, so Karen, where do you want to start here? Yeah, why don't we start with Pocket and Neil? I feel like it's the hottest thing right now. I saw a tweet today that they've already made twelve million dollars. Uh, so, the game's doing very well. Uh, yeah. So, Neil, have you had a chance to play Pocket yet? I have had a chance to play Pocket. Uh, I can't say I played a ton. I probably opened like I don't know, fifty, sixty packs. Nothing crazy. Yeah, I mean, um, I played as well. I'm just opening my phone right now to see what level I am um it's like okay it's kind of like my vibe of the game so far so everyone i've yeah. talked to all my friends who don't play like the actual tcg they like pocket a lot uh i think just for me like um i don't really care about collecting at all like that's just never been my thing i just care about playing games uh i just think the gameplay is like really boring if you play the main tcg and like it's so hard to build decks for i swear i've opened like 100 packs and i still don't have like a meta deck and i'm not gonna spend money <laughs> on the game so uh, I signed up for the free trial of the past, but like I'm not gonna keep paying for it. I just don't think it's worth it. Um, yeah, so. I just try to unlock my phone to look at my pocket. My face ID is not working because I'm a <laughs> so I'm, I'm going through the hard way right now. But I, I, I agree with you. I think as somebody who plays the game, I mean, for us, like mean, it's like a profession at this point, right? But um, even if you play the game casually, uh, play TCG casually, like within the TCG Live universe, this game probably feels pretty boring to you. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm level 14. Yeah, I think maybe two. Like, it's just their very first set. So, like, maybe, like, as the sets come out, I'm hoping they add more depth to the game. But it seems like the best decks right now are literally just, like, beat sticks. Like, oh, there's the Pikachu deck that's just, like, Circle Circuit, do 90. There's the Articuno deck where it's just, like, you try and scam Misty turn one. There's a Mewtwo deck where it's just, like, do 150. Um, so, yeah, it just doesn't feel like there's a lot of depth. It's, like, a lot of luck. Like, a lot of the mechanics are, are dumbed down, which I think is fine, but... Uh, I, I don't think you've played this game, Neil, but there's a game called Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, where it was like, it was like Yu-Gi-Oh! with like only like three bench spots and like three trap zone cards. And I, I played it for a bit when it came out as someone who hasn't, hadn't really ever played Yu-Gi-Oh! that seriously. And like, I really like that game. Uh, but it felt like yeah. that one's, like, they kind of dumbed down Yu-Gi-Oh! But it was still way more in-depth than, than what Pokemon Pocket is. So, um, I don't know, I might like log yeah, in every day to open my packs, but, oh, nice. Yay, Venusaur. Yeah, <laughs> I have the free trial thing as well, and I'm like, I'm opening these packs, and I just don't really know what I'm looking for, just because I can't find myself, I can't bring myself to go on YouTube, or like go online and actively like look up what I want to do with this game, because I just feel like there are so many better things that we could be spending our time on than TCG Pocket, because like, we play the real game, you know, like it's just, it feels like it's not catered to us, which it, yeah, it's that's not, fine. right? So, yeah. And that's fine. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely fine. So, no, I agree with you. Um, I don't know. The other thing, too, is, like, the set is so big. Like, there's so many filler cards. And, like, it's almost impossible to pull what you want. Like, they show you the pull rates. And then you can craft cards, but you have to open 100 packs to get enough, like, crafting points to make, like, one EX. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a very pay-to-win game right now, or pay-to-play game, I guess. Um, so, yeah, hopefully it improves. So I'll keep my eye on it. I'll play every once in a while. 
Actually, no, should I do a live pocket pack opening right now on, on the shift gear? Yeah, run it, run it. Okay, I have to spend my pack opening credits to get it. Okay, wait. All right, I always pick Mewtwo as my pack. I feel like everybody picks Mewtwo. I don't know why. So I didn't know this, but the, the packs have different stuff. Like, they're mini sets from which, which pack you get. Yeah, I didn't know that either until recently. Okay, right on. Very nice. Jinx. So oh, I haven't had Jinx yet. Alan Zubat. Alan Zubat. Gibliuptile. Oh, my, like, fifth Electros. Let's go. <laughs> Electros. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. And, like, that, that, well, that's my thing with this whole thing. It's, like, it's a big enough set that you're not getting, like, a ton of duplicates, but it feels like there's a lot of room for growth with what cards are coming out of here. I just wish there's, there was a little yeah. bit more intricacy. There's 226 cards, so, like, yeah, there's just so much. It's just, it's hard to pull what you want, pretty much, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, and but the one thing I have noticed, you know, I kind of want to ask your thoughts on, it's, like, it, the game is popping off. Like, I see on Twitter, like, it get tweets with the game, get tons of engagement. There's already been tournaments with like tons of people on Limitless. On YouTube, it seems like people are watching. So I'm curious if like all this pocket uh, interest is going to translate to interest in the actual card game. Kind of like a little gateway to like get people to play it. But like, yeah. I don't know. It's like it, it might be just too separate of a thing. And I think that's the idea, right? I feel like that's the idea behind it. Aside from like, hey, we're going to make a quick 12 million bucks. Like it, it does make a lot of sense to kind of have a, that's what they're trying to do with live, right? Trying to make like a lower barrier entry gateway to playing the game. And, and it worked for the most part, right? Like we've seen crazy numbers. But with Pocket, like you said, the game is so different that it might be difficult for people to make that jump. Like I've, I've already had a couple of my buddies like kind of ask me like, hey man, like how do you get into the real TCG? I started playing Pocket. And I don't have a good answer for them because they start playing the real TCG and they're like, this is not as fun as Pocket, right? Because it's just, it, it's not the same feeling. So I think, yeah, you might see like a little bit of a, a market increase, but I don't think, like you mentioned, like, I don't think there's going to be a crazy increase in, in, in players trying to play the real TCG. Yeah, I guess just Pocket has mass appeal. So like, even if they capture like 1% interest in like trying the real game, like that's a huge amount of people. So I, I'm curious if maybe like, we'll, it'll probably be like a year or two from now if we can, if we see like the numbers jump and like, you can attribute that to Pocket. Um, it'll be interesting, too, if Pokemon eventually like starts doing Pocket tournaments like on our circuit. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they will. I don't know. Maybe. Be... I'm more interested to see if like content creators in the TCGverse start going towards Pocket now, just because of how hyped up it is. Like We saw it with Go. Yeah. There's a lot of TCG player or content creators that went to Go when that happened. Like I don't know. Like, And I also think it has a lot less longevity than Go did. Like, Go is still a very active game, right? Like, people still play it eight years later. Uh, eight years from now, do I think we'll be playing Pocket? Probably not. So, I don't know if it's going to have the same long-term appeal. I don't know if it's just a fad. Like, there's so much to really be yeah. uncovered here still. Yeah, I think they eventually have to make it easier to get cards, or else people... Like, I know it'll happen. Like, it's hyped right now, so, like, they don't, they're making it hard to get cards that you buy. Eventually, like, the numbers start to dwindle, and they'll start, like, offering, like, a lot of, like, cards and, like, packs for free uh and then we'll see if it has longevity so yeah it's pretty cool it's i guess a little sad that uh how nice the client is compared to live like one of my friends who like he's casually played the tc before he's like oh yeah pocket like this is way better than when i tried out the other one of the game i'm like yep <laughs> yeah uh, it, it it is really really strange it, it, it makes you wonder where they're allocating their money i guess they're allocating their money into more money which makes a lot of sense from a business perspective yep so yeah, it'll be cool. We'll keep an eye on Pocket. Uh, and you know, if I had to say yes or no, within the next year, there's real Pocket tournaments. What would you say? I say yes. Absolutely. I think yes as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'll yeah, happen. Sure. And then uh, there's no reason not to. Like you already have such a big bunch of people invested in this game, you might as well give them a reason to keep investing, right? Yeah. It'll be like uh, they can go in the corner with the Pokemon Go people at our tournaments. <laughs> yeah, our tournaments aren't big enough already. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, <Pocket. laughs> Great. So, I was well, actually, I really wanted to wear this costume to LAIC, but I realized I probably wouldn't be allowed to because I've got like a, a mask on. But I had like four Halloween costumes. I was also a family video employee, American Friends. You guys will know what family video is. Uh, I don't think it ever came to Canada, but it was in America. Um, and I was also a giant can of White Claw. Uh, all three of these things, I don't think I'd be able to get into a Pokemon tournament with. Maybe the family video employee, but... You might be able to, um, honestly, bro. Yeah, like, I don't know, just... I want to I wanna be more fun at tournaments, right? I'm trying to, like, yeah. to do stupid stuff, but there's so many people there now that you get so many dirty looks that it's almost like, I don't know if this is worth it. But anyway, sorry, <laughs> back to regular scheduled programming. I'm ranting about Halloween again. No, I love it. Uh, I mean, the venue in Sao Paulo is very hot, so I don't know if I would wear that if I were you. It but... is. <laughs> yeah. 
I remember uh, that actually. Cool. All right, so that's, let's let's move on to the real trading card game now, Neil. We had a regional in Gdansk, Poland, on the weekend. Uh, Alberto Conti took it down with Reggie Drago. So that's back-to-back doubles for Reggie Drago. I think we were talking for a little bit, like, oh, Drago hadn't won anything for a long time, and now it's one back-to-back. Um, mm-hmm. The top cut was very interesting. There was two Iron Thorns and two Bennett, um, which I don't think was expected, to be honest. Uh... But yeah, I think let's start off with Alberto's list here. Uh, we don't have the rest of the results from Gdansk, but honestly, I don't think you guys care that much since we've had like so many regionals in this format. Uh, and the top cut was actually the most interesting thing anyways. So he, um, he went back to like a more traditional Reggie Drago list. Like he actually cut the Noctowl line uh, and he played like a third Iono and a fourth Vessel. He was just playing more upfront consistency inside like the power that Noctowl Respect, gives. Bro. So Respect, yeah, I mean, bro. I think it's solid. Um, Noctowl is a very strong card when you get to pull it off. But you don't always get to pull it off, right? So um, I think this approach is just saying, like, hey, we all knew Reggie Drago was good the old way. Uh, let's just go back to it. So what do you think, Neil? Yeah, I think the one thing that's kind of been... I don't remember if I've touched on this in a video before, but the like the, the value of double Super Rod now, as opposed... And, like, the revelation of what double Super Rod can provide, rather than, like, one and one or whatever. Like, some people were playing two Superior back in the day. I feel like it gives you a lot more versatility, and that's something that's kind yeah. of been underrated. So that, like... Second super rod enables your rads are to be looped more and stuff like that. And and the, and the spots you save from not having the knocked out, I think you can put towards, I don't know, just, just consistency, making sure you yeah, play it's, the it's game. It's upfront like consistency. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Like you, you kind of sacrifice that like down the line consistency for upfront consistency, which is a great way to put it. So yeah. I like it. I mean, your deck is designed to to run over your opponent anyways. So Cutting the Noctile to me makes sense. Um, I like the idea that he's just prioritizing playing the game, which with Drago is often what kind of holds it back. And we've talked so much about, hey, Drago's been so good, but it hadn't won like a huge, huge tournament. And a lot of that is chalked up to inconsistency. Like eventually you're going to run into a time where you just can't set up, right? So I like this approach. And maybe this is something that we need to jot down in our notebooks. Like this consistent approach won this person a tournament. And of course, it was coupled with, with fantastic play and, and, and a lot of testing, but there is a lot yeah. of merit to just playing consistency. I'm going to assume the answer is no, but did you watch the finals, Anil? Absolutely not. Uh, it came down <laughs> to time. Like, uh, like Tor just couldn't take enough prize cards, and, and he lost on time uh, in the finals. I feel like so. he's always getting himself into these unfortunate situations, isn't he? Yeah, it seems like Tor has been uh, not turbo-Tord enough lately in the last in some of his finals. But uh, yeah, so with Tor, he played Traffic to second place with a pretty unique build. Um, the immediate standouts to me are the one Dustnor. Um, yeah. he he stuck with Buffalon and the two two Pidgeot. Uh, so I would honestly say Tord is playing like a Pidgeot deck with Trafigos. <laughs> is what I I'm saying. I'm yeah, seeing that's here. a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like he's playing like a bunch of one of supporters, like one boss, one penny, one Terra, one Thornton, one Briar, and he does play one Palpat to try and reuse them. So, um, it's a really cool take on Trafigos. So. This is actually interesting that we've seen from Tord lately. Is like he's actually been playing less consistent lists. Like this list is way less consistent than like the uh, Traffico's list that made top eight in Louisville and the kind of like what I've been pushing. Um, you know, like you're playing the Bouffalons, which are like they're kind of hard to get out because uh, you have to like use your nest balls on them. There's only three pop in, only three three Noctowl, a two zero one Dustnor line. Um, so he like kind of likes having this like bag of tricks. I think if you watch some of his stream games, like he was using Thornton to like get like Pidgeot and, and play against like Reggie Drago, since you can't bench Pidgey normally since it has sixty health and gets sniped by Dragapult. Um, you know he had a game against Bennett where he was using Turo and Penny to like kind of like maneuver, which is kind of cool. Uh, he had the Bouffants there, I guess, to kind of protect against like Kiram and protect against uh, like Charizard. So um, definitely a more anti-meta at- approach to Terrapagos. Um, which I don't hate, and it's just kind of like playing less into the Dustnor aggro package. Um, yeah, it's almost like a different, yeah, it's a completely different take, I think, on what we've been seeing as like the standard Terrapico builds. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I've, I mean, so I came back like three days ago and started playing Pokemon again. I emerged back from the darkness like I was like Aaron Rodgers on a retreat. Um, but I, uh, the first thing I touched was something that was two cards off from this. And I started playing quite a bit and it, and I actually played it a little bit while I was in the darkness. I went to a couple tourneys on the lows. Um, but I was playing a list very similar to this. And the one change that I find I- extravagant here is the, uh, 202 Pidgeot, right? Like there's so many times, and I know we've talked about it on pod before where one part of that puzzle is prized and, 
as much as it's like a non-issue most of the time, it does really feel bad when one in five games you can't get a Pidgeot up. So I really like the 202 Pidgeot. Uh, that's personally something that I really like. Bufalante, bro. Bufalante is insane. Um, I understand it's very gimmicky. It can be. Um, tough to set up. Bench spots wasted. But, bro, it is really, really good. Uh, can swing a lot of games. So I understand the merit behind Bufalante. The one thing I'm not a fan of is this uh, low Dustnor line, because I feel like Dustnor is such a important part of what this deck is. Like, your strength as a deck is you just run people off the board a lot of the time, and with one Dustnor, and, like, if you prize that one Dustnor, there's no way to get it out. It feels pretty bad. So that's the one thing that I think I personally wouldn't like, but this is a very Tord deck, right? Like, this is one of those builds that we will pick up, or whoever will pick up, and you'll try, and you'll be like, I don't understand how this guy wins with this, but <laughs> it's just a Tord deck. Like, that's yeah. all it is. And the Penny Turo package is really strong. I played with it quite a bit. It, it allows you to kind of punish people for not playing Vitality Band and Mirror or, like, things like that, where you can kind of just recycle your, your damaged mans. And you can also, I mean, use it to... Um, it, there's a lot of, like, weird applications where it's also just a switch. So it's not too Yeah, bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the idea is more so it's, like, your trap goes are going to be tankier, so, like, you can actually heal them with Penny. Uh, my, yeah. my problem I have with Bufalant, besides it just being annoying to set up, is, like, if your opponent plays a Counter Stadium... If I keep both my Bufalant, like, that's a lot of bench space. Like, it's, I have to keep Bufalant, Bufalant, yeah. Pidgeot. That's like, what else do I keep? Like, I probably have to keep at least one Hoot Hoot. And then, like, I don't know, I keep a Dusk Skull. So it's like, that's another thing that's a little shaky. Uh, and yeah. Bufalant is good against Charizard, but they play Collapse. So if they Collapse when I have Bufalant in play, it's like, man, I really don't know if I can keep Bufalant. Because then, like, they counter catch my Hoot Hoot or my Pidgeot. Uh, I feel like my board just kind of collapses, so... Yeah, you get um, yeah. a lot of junk on your field sometimes, though, too, right? Like, with Noctowls and Fan Rotom yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, and like, it's, yeah. yeah. No, it's normally there's also times, discard, but... Yeah. yeah, sorry. There's also times as well where, because Bufalant is so strong, you're able to discard, like, a another piece of your attacking puzzle because you know your Trap Ghost isn't getting knocked out if you keep the Boofies. Yeah. So that, that's, that's another, like, kind of underrated part of this is, like, yeah, sometimes you're going to need to prepare to get knocked out every turn, but with Boofy, you can kind of, uh, I don't know, play around that a little bit. Yeah, um, maybe I'll have to give Towards Build uh, a try here and see see how I like it. Because, I mean, I love playing Trapagos, so maybe this will uh, reinvigorate some of that love for me. Because I think the problem, I was, I, was, I was discussing this with someone the other day, where it was like, I actually think on paper, Trapagos has the highest max, like expected win rate matchup spread of any deck. Just because if you go first, it's like, you're obviously like going to favor it. But the problem is like, it has trouble sometimes when it goes second, because like, you're just playing from too far behind, you can't trigger the Dust Noise, so... Um, maybe like the Bufalant is a way to kind of combat that. Um, it, this is a less aggressive build. Like you're not gonna like get as ahead if you like go first, but definitely like when you go second, have more counterplay, which I think is cool. Um, yeah. cool. And then like there's another Rich Jago top four, and then there's two a pair of Bennets here. Uh, they actually face each other in top eight, which is kind of sad. So, uh, big shout out to Mateus finally making top eight with Bennett in his home city. I think he said, uh, which is awesome. So you can see here this is his fourth uh, limitless entry. With Bennett. First time getting it done for top eight, so that's awesome. Uh he was taken down by Magnus. Um but yeah, I think this is like he changed a little bit of his list actually. What did he change? Um I'm not gonna like know off the top of my head, but I just look oh he yeah, played Screamtail now. He played Screamtail. Uh I think okay. Screamtail is a response to Lugia. Uh, I think Screamtail, like you know, just gives you a chance to take out the Archaeops. Um otherwise the matchup is like literally like unwinnable. Um so and when you talk about that too, I think the meta is like it, I think the meta really respected Lugia this weekend. Uh, this is the first major tournament without Lugia in the top eight. We also saw two Iron Thorns in the top eight. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like this deck is. I think we've been saying for a while it's like a pretty strong deck. I think collectively the community has understood that uh, it's starting to go up and play every tournament. Like I would say, this is actually like uh, it might, it's like competing to maybe make the first page of the graphic now uh, a meta share. So, yeah, I think heading into LAIC, I think Bennett is just going like, to keep going up and up and play. Yeah. I mean, this this deck is strong. It's one of those things, though, like Thorns and like uh, like Snorlax, where when people are prepared for it, it gets a little weaker. So yep. um, you gotta you gotta consider the other edge of that sword, right? Where now it's getting some press. Uh, it got a lot of press a couple weeks ago, but now that it's there's two of them in top eight, it might be uh, a little bit more popular than Bennett players would like. So uh, yes. I mean, I, I still think it's a great play. I think there's gonna be a lot of people who don't care about it, but there is definitely gonna be a couple people who maybe reconsider their deck choices just based off this. Yeah, the one problem I have with Bennett from just me playing it, it's a little inconsistent, which I don't love. Uh, but, I mean, once you get going, it's like it's pretty powerful once you can start locking people. Um, yeah. So, yeah, very cool deck. Uh, happy, Very happy for Mateus specifically to make top eight with this. 
Um, it feels like he's long overdue as a creator of the archetype. You know? mm-hmm. uh, then we have two Iron Thorns in the top cut. Um, I don't really know what they played against. I assume they played against a lot of Lugia. Uh, they both lost to Reggie Drago, I think, in, in top eight, um, which makes kind of sense. Um, I don't know if Daniel played Noctowl. If you play Noctowl, it's like really easy to beat Iron Thorns because you can just find the clone when you want it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It's, Thorns is like one of those decks where it's like, it's solid. If you hit the right matchups, you're going to go far. I just think it's very hard to win a tournament uh, with a deck. Like, um, but, I mean, there's so much Lugia. Like, Lugia was the second most played deck. I mean, it's been doing so well lately that it's like, yeah, it made sense to pull out Thorns, I think, for this tournament, right? Um, yeah. Thorns your are other so matchups weird, are okay, dude. so. It's just such a, like, a, you're traveling to this, this faraway place to play in this tournament, and, like, you're playing Iron Thorns. Like, it just feels... <laughs> And, and no disrespect to any Iron Thorns players, because I think you guys Full have disrespect. the guts out of anybody there. <laughs> yeah. y- y'all, have some, y'all have some guts, man. Like, to play that after you pay how, however many hundreds of dollars or pounds, I guess in this case, or euros, to go to these places, like, you're risking it all on uh, on Iron Thorns and Tom giving you what you want? Yeah, man, respects. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as a Lugia player, I don't love seeing that Iron Thorns is 5% of the meta, up from its, like, 2% share, but... I mean, it's the same thing. It's like if you're if you're if you play Lugia and you're scared of Thorns, it's just like just don't hit it. Like that's just every deck has bad matchups, right? So it's like yeah. I still wouldn't be too concerned. Um, like looking at this top eight, I mean, like there's still like Bennett, so this is a good matchup. Snowmax good matchup. I think Lugia's still in a fine spot. Um, yeah, Snowmax made top eight. I'm curious if it was a more traditional Snorlax or if it was like the one that Sander played with the boxed order. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it just seems like uh, this was probably the most interesting top cut we've had all year uh, with the decks that did end up making it. So, um, I, I predict Lugia will bounce back for LAIC. I think at least one will make top eight. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, I think it goes to show, right, the meta is evolving. I think I think it was it took way too long for people to start respecting Lugia to the level it's getting respected now. Uh, it'll be interesting, though, now if Lugia's numbers go down because people are scared off by all this respect that it's been getting now. Um I think it was around, I think it started around like, like it was like 6 or 7% in Baltimore, all the way up to 12% of the meta in Gdansk here. Um, so for LAIC, yeah, I'm I curious think, if it'll drop below double digits. Well, I think guys like yourself and, and Rahul and, and people who've been consistently doing well with it are, are giving a lot of good press to it as well, in terms of like what the, the negative kind of connotations were to Lugia before and, and how inconsistent it was perceived to be, stuff like that. So I think like when people kind of see that in mass media, like, there's a lot more temptation to at least try the deck. I know Lugia has been around forever, but just like top players kind of doing well with it and saying like, Hey, this deck is not as inconsistent as you think, I think opens a lot of eyes. So, I mean, you, you guys can contribute a lot of that to yourselves as well. Like in the yeah, sense that it's sure. gone up so much. So yeah, the amount uh, of, uh, it'll, it'll bounce back. the amount of Lugia coaching I've done, the amount of people tagging me on Twitter that they're winning their cups with my list. I'm like, damn, I, uh, yeah. I'm like infesting the meta with some more Lugias. <laughs> Thanks man. Yeah, no problem, bro. Uh, happy, happy <laughs> to do it. So, um, cool. Then before we jump to our next segment, I thought maybe we could do, do our "Am I in the wrong for this week?" Um, sure. I've got a good submission here. Um, yeah, let me just make sure there's no identifying things before I read this. Okay, perfect. All right, so here we go, Neil. So my opponent in top four of a cup had his friend next to him the entire set, who I had played against earlier in Swiss. Both he and my opponent spoke a different language than me and conferred between games of the set. There is no judge consistently present for either top four game as they were busy with hosting two other events at once, and both top four matches occurred side by side in an isolated room. I didn't say anything about it to them in the moment because I didn't want to come off as rude or ignorant. I spoke to the judge after my match and asked that my opponent not be allowed to have their friend to sit by them and confer between games, as there could have been coaching occurring. Am I in the wrong to ask that of the judge, or am I ignorant for asking such a thing? <laughs> yeah, this is a tough one. I think for me, a lot of the, the basis to are you in the wrong or not kind of is derived from your articulation of the situation. So, like, are they speaking during critical turns, or are they just seeming like they're kind of having a chat? I think that's kind of where I sit with this whole thing. Like, I've been in the situation before where I was cool with it. I was at like a local and they were speaking Mandarin to each other. And I was like, okay, like, obviously I don't understand what the hell is going on here. <laughs> um, and I just allowed, I, I allowed it. Cause I'm like, I don't, I had really that situation too. Levels. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a very common Torontonian situation. So I was like, okay, I don't really care. Um, but it came out later that they were actually like, like conversing about the game and they were, I don't want to say cheating. That sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot of yeah. baggage for locals, but um, there's definitely some advantage being gained there. So I think it, using it in context is really important is the lesson that I kind of took out of my personal experience with that. Like, is the context like okay they're conferring in between games it sounds like they're asking like hey bro do you want to get a beer after like that's one thing right but it's another thing to be like on a pivotal turn the guy's saying like hey man you should uh you should refine it before you boss or whatever right like you you gain a lot in that situation so i would pay a lot of attention to when they're speaking and that's kind of how i would make that judgment call but i don't think you're in the wrong for asking someone no. asking the judge to be like hey stop i think it's like every week like we say or like never be afraid to ask the judge i think especially like if you're in an isolated room and your opponent's like you're not supposed to be talking to outside people while you're playing a match, right? Like, yeah. if you've ever played locals, if you have, like, a tight community, like, you know, no one cares like, if you guys are, like, chatting or whatever during a match. Uh, but normally, everyone speaks the same language, so, like, you understand what's going on. Um, <clears throat> in this case, it sounds like, like, you also didn't know your opponent that well, or his friend. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would have just, like, asked, if you're uncomfortable, I would just call the judge and be like, hey, like, I don't really feel comfortable with, like, my opponent having someone speaking to them during a match. Um, yeah. Yeah, honestly, like, just, like, I don't know, like, it, just be careful sometimes, I guess, around, like, other people, like, if, like, there's not really a reason for them, people, to be conversing with their friends during a match, like, they should be focused, right? Um, I have a story one time where I'm pretty sure people, like, I played a League Cup at a place that I'm, uh, I hadn't really gone before, it wasn't, like, near where I live, and I was pretty sure my opponents were, like, signaling with one of his friends, like, during Top Cut, <laughs> uh, and I should have said something. But I didn't, but like I was so sure of it because like I was playing Luke, like the worst iteration of Lugia, like no one it was like the Tyranitar X and all that. Oh god. I was playing as Gardevoir. I went first. Like my hand was really bad. Like I literally played like Lugia, attach, like bench something, and like pass. My hand was like four or five cards. But I had Burnett and I had Lugia V Star. My opponent had like Ralts in the active. And he literally just went Luminion for Judge. I was like, there is no way that is ever the correct play in that situation. <laughs> uh, and like, I, I, I saw him like looking behind me and his friends were always standing there. And I, I heard some stuff after, but I was like, I don't know. So yeah, that's just like, I don't know, just be careful, I guess. Like if you ever feel uncomfortable, like you should call a judge. Like I probably should have in that situation. Um, yeah, no, don't ever, feel, like, like we always said, don't ever feel bad for calling a judge, uh, especially if you're not really sure what's going on. Um, like, for yeah. example, when I, when I play at, like, LEIC or Worlds, like, whenever a ruling happens and, like, my opponent doesn't speak English, like, the judge will be, like, like, if they're, if the player is speaking, like, for example, I had an incident at LEIC one time, the, my opponent was, like, speaking Spanish, like, the judge was, like, oh, like, you need a translator because you don't understand, like, what he's saying or what's going on, right? So, um, yeah, always don't feel uncomfortable just being, like, hey, like, do you mind if I uh, <laughs> just know what's going on? Or maybe ask your opponent, like, hey, what are you guys talking about? Yeah, yeah, uh, like, then make a judgment involved. call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Good uh, yeah, you are, you would not be in the wrong to our. Severe. It's actually kind of funny that like you and I specifically are the ones giving judge call advice to people because I feel like uh, I guess I'll speak for myself on this one, but I feel like you're mostly the same. Is like we let a lot of stuff go. Like we're not really, <laughs> yes. we're not really like ratting people out very often. Like I, at least for myself, I'll speak on that. Like I've been in some tense ass situations where people have done some sketchy stuff, and I just don't care. Like. I'm like, yes. all right, whatever, just just continue. I don't care. So it's kind of ironic that it's us saying, hey, call a judgment. Maybe it's a lesson to us. Like, we should be less uh, less forgiving overall. But I personally, and I know you as well, are not in the business of making enemies. Um, yeah. We like to have a good time playing this game. But I think if my opponent's a rat, yeah, I'm calling the judge. Yes, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's I, I think, honestly, like, the vibes for me. Like, if I ever pick up, I let someone take something back. Like, or if I'm, like like lenient or whatever is like literally like if the vibes are good if you're a nice person if you're not like oh yeah. i have no issues like uh made difficult actually no did i tell that story on the podcast bro when the guy shuffled his evil tall into his deck against me i, I don't remember if you did but <laughs> so i think i should tell it actually <laughs> so this was this was ocic 2023 i played against okay. a player um from japan so he didn't speak english right which is fine that's not an issue uh because like when you play pokemon like everyone just knows what the cards do so he was playing like the Lugia with like the Evil Tall that discards energies. And at one yeah. point I knocked out his Evil Tall and this guy straight up, instead of discarding it, shuffled the Evil Tall into his deck and then just drew for turn and started playing. I was like, bro, like, uh, or sorry, he didn't draw it. He, I'm, like, I'm like, oh, bro, you just like shuffled that instead of putting your discard. I'm like, I'm like, yo, let's just get the judge. Seat. I'm like, you can put it in your discard and then just draw it. Like, I don't need a penalty or anything. This guy yeah. just picks up his deck, looks for Evil Tall double turbo, uh, puts it in his discard pile, doesn't shuffle, draws a card, and just starts playing and just ignoring me. I was like, well, I'm like, what the hell? 
So I was like, okay, I probably should call a judge. But I was in like such a winning position that I was like, whatever, bro. Like, I do not care. But I was yeah, just like, yeah. what the heck was going on? So See, that's that's a time where my opponent is perceived to be a rat. And I'm like, this guy's a complete rat. I'm calling a judge. Like, I don't care, bro. This guy's like, this guy's tripping, putting his evil top. It's one thing to put it back and then be like, yo, my bad. I understand there's a language barrier, but um there's nothing to know and like, like this guy has been around long enough he's playing an ic he knows you're not supposed to just like search your deck pluck these things out and then draw a card for a turn like come on man don't be a rodent that's the I time like, where i'm like yo judge sup yeah i was like maybe it's a cultural difference or something you just like maybe you just fix it on your own and i was like okay <laughs> like whatever but i was like i was like very interesting if, if the game was closer like if i, I would have probably been like okay like let's actually get the judge but i'm like I mean, yeah. I mean, he drew the card he was going to draw for turn anyways, so and, like, the thing ended up in the discard, so I was like, okay, whatever. Like, let's just keep going. <laughs> don't need to involve the ops, I guess. No, so. Uh, but don't do what I did. You guys call a judge or turn if that happens. Yeah, no. y'all call a judge. Don't be like us. <laughs> All right, awesome, Neil. Uh, good, good. Am I in the wrong this week? Um, all right, we have a couple more topics left. I think we can jump to There's some EV Lucian cards revealed. I think the next set is an EV set called Terrastal Festival um yes. my first impression of the ev cards were like they're kind of mediocre there weren't really that many that stood out to me um so just before we go through them i want to show everyone ev ex if it's on this page yeah so ev ex has this ability that you can put in a pokemon ex that have also some ev onto it um so you can play four like normal evs and you can play four ev ex and the normal ev its ability is if it's in the active and it gets an energy you can evolve it uh the turn you do it so in theory you can have like eight evs and like evolve them all uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah. I don't really know if we've seen that mechanic. Uh, we might have seen something similar to it before. I can't just remember off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, we have all the evolutions. They are each getting an EX. So let's go through all of them. Uh, they're all Terra types, uh, even though they're, they all say it as their main types. But yeah, they're all Terra Pokemon. Uh, and you can see that all their second attacks all have very weird energy costs. So the first one we have is the Leafeon EX. Um, its first attack is Grass Colorless. It does 60 damage for each energy attached to all of your opponent's Pokemon. And second attack for grass, fire, water, 230, heal 100 from each of your bench Pokemon. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know, Leaf Typhoon could be okay against stuff that's weak to grass. Um, but even against Charizard, like, they, if they only put two in play, you can't one-shot them. Um, I, know, I think the idea is going to kind of be you're supposed to play, like, an EV box type deck to, like, uh, take advantage of, like, weakness. Maybe you play super effective glasses. So, I mean, there are meta cards that are weak to grass. So this one, I wouldn't be that surprised if it saw some level of play. And that's, sorry, I can't see through my little mask thing. Here. That's Grass Colorless for the first attack? Yeah, Grass Colorless. Yeah, that's, not, that's actually not bad. Yeah, we can deal with that. Because you, um, you have Thing as well, Sparkling Crystal. So it really could just be Grass or just Colorless. Yeah. Which is pretty good. Yeah, I think Sparkling Crystal is probably going to be a must if you play this deck, since like, all the EVs have different energy costs, right? So like the, all their first yeah, attacks like, like, are their type, and then you can just put normal energy, I guess, or whatever energy in attack. Yeah, because I was like thinking as you were saying that, I'm like, why do these need to be Terra Pokemon? And then it kind of made sense. I, I still feel to this day like Terra is such like a wasted mechanic, but yeah, just the fact well, that Crystal says, hey, they have to be Terra. I think the reason that's important that they're Chris, uh, Terra type is you can use Glass Trumpet because EVEX is a, is a colorless Pokemon, or even Eevee is a colorless. Yeah. So like you can just like accelerate that way, uh, which I think is yeah. very important. So. Uh, well, I yeah, think it's... the Terra, like the Terra typing, is important for the cards that support it. But I mean, like the Terra as a whole, and the oh, effect yeah, yeah, that yeah. it provides. Like, hey, we're gonna print all these cards with Terra type, and they're all gonna just say Bench Barrier. I think that's such a waste. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, okay, cool. So I think the second attack is whatever. Like, there's no way healing 100 from each of your Bench Pokemon is like gonna come up that often. Yeah. Like your guys are just getting one shot probably. <laughs> yeah, all right, next up, Flareon. Uh, fire colorless 130 search your deck for two basic energy attached to one of your pokemon uh its second attack is fire water lightning 280 during your next turn pokemon can attack i mean its first attack is like uh if you go first and your opponent has like a little pokemon in the active like you can kind of like power your get some stuff going i mean its second attack literally just reads like knock out of east star uh which is important um yeah. i mean rotation is coming like around when this set comes out so honestly stuff like lugia and, and red drago might be gone by then but if they overlap, I think this is this will probably be like important to make sure you can take out those those key cards. Yeah, it's not even like you can put Max Belt in either because you need Crystal. So I, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, like we've only gone over a couple, and I don't really remember these too well. But I can't imagine a world where the EV deck is played without Crystal. So um, you're probably pretty well constrained to what your yeah. damage output kind of just is. 
So and it, you're not hitting your three three thirties for Zard or Dragapult or anything. You're kind of just you're just vibing. Yeah. So I think this might be a deck that plays that Terrapagos where it's like you can put three energies on your your guys. Maybe that's another way you can power up. Mm -hmm. Um. Cool. All right. Vaporeon, Water Colorless. This attack does sixty of each of your opponent's Pokemon EX. Then it has actually it has the same attack as uh as Flare onward, but this time it's fire. Oh no, it's the same fire, water, lightning, right? They both yeah, fire, water, lightning, two eighty. Um, I don't know, sixty to each EX. That just seems too slow to me. Uh, the decks yeah. that would be good against are the decks that like play heavy EXs, like Raging Bolt, for example. But that deck is so fast that I don't think you have time to hit them. Like you need them like four times. Uh, you can't also, even hit Ogre. Hit, you can't hit Ogre Pond. Yeah, like the Terra yeah. effect. <laughs> so I don't know. Before it just doesn't seem good to me. Um. If there's Pokemon weak to water, like maybe use it for the 280 attack, but uh, doesn't yeah, seem very good. I got to me. nothing to add. This seems pretty bad. All right, Glaceon, the other water Pokemon in the set. Uh, it's, it always gets this attack every iteration of Glaceon. It's like water yeah. colors, 110, 30, 20 opponent's bench Pokemon. Uh, its other attack for grass, water, dark is knock one of your opponent's Pokemon out that has exactly six damage counters. So the first part was promising. Um, I don't know, this seems really hard to use. Like, how am I getting exactly six damage counters on something and then powering this thing up consistently to keep taking knockouts? Like, you yeah. could maybe use Iron Valiant um, and then find a way to power this guy up. But that just seems like a lot to ask. Uh, but it, it says knock out one of the, your opponent's Pokemon, so it could be on the bench, so you could set up stuff on the bench to be knocked out. Um, I don't know, this just seems tricky. But, you know, what? this one does seem like a deck could be made around this specifically. Like, maybe? I just like just none yeah, of these yeah. seem like they're above the level of gimmick to me. Yeah, so far. I think what they were trying to do is they wanted to make all the EVs like slightly mediocre because you can play them all together. But like I don't know if they have a superstar one yet. Um, well, and like a part of this as well, and I think Pokemon TV has learned their lesson a little bit with this is the problem with Evolving Skies and the reason why the set ballooned like crazy is A, the artwork is really good, B, their EVs, but C, and most importantly in that time, the cards were playable. And they were very, very playable. And it drove this set like through the roof because people were ripping just to play the game. And mm -hmm. like people would use these alt arts or whatever they pulled and it would lower the, the pop of like good ones at PSA and stuff like that. So, and like, I don't know what the Pokemon company stance is specifically on, hey, do we want to hype up these sets or not? Like, I feel like it's good for them to kind of not hype up one specific set because it allows them to sell other product products. Um, because, like, you look now and, like, who's buying, like, a Cyclozar EX box that doesn't doesn't have, like, Evolving Skies in it, right? Like, <laughs> nobody wants it unless the product contains the, the set that they want. So I think from a business perspective, what you want is you want all sets to be hyped up kind of equally, maybe a couple of bit more than others, but... I think overall they learned their lesson like, hey, we shouldn't hype up this one non-holiday set because we can't make enough money off it. Well, I mean, I think any set with EVs will sell. Because, I mean, like, most people who buy the sets are oh, just always. collectors, right? So, yeah, yeah. Actually, you don't want it to sell too well. That's fair. I think this next EV illusion is actually probably the best one when I remember when I was looking through it. was the Jolteon. So it's first attack, lightning colors. It's 60, but you can discard two basic energy from your bench and do 90 more for each. So you can do 240. So basically, if you like play Glass Trumpet, you can like get rid of the energy and do 240. And 240 is actually a pretty good number. That's pretty much the amount of health that all the basic EXs have. Um, and then the second attack, it's again like the 280 that all the other evolutions have. If you need to go up a little bit in the damage, so um, also knocks out Pidgeot. So I don't know. This one yeah. seems like somewhat potential to me. Uh, it's, it's energy cost is low. I think it's very low maintenance to keep getting that 240 off. Um, I guess my only like qualm with it would be is like I feel like a lot of other decks can also do 240 for not that much effort. Um, yeah. But I mean, if you play Jolteon, you can use like the EV as a, and have like a single prize board before you evolve. So um, I don't know. This one seems okay to me. Not the best, but it seems okay. You could also maybe in a weird world use this with Maridon to enable Area Zero. Um, yeah, you have to evolve though. Like I feel like Pikachu's yeah, still better for it. that. Yeah, Mewtwo's probably just still better. Like, I don't really... This is just kind of Raging Bolt, like, boneless Raging Bolt, kind of. <laughs> like, yeah, this is like, take out Raging Bolt. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really move me in any way, but I understand what you're saying. I do think it's the one with the most promise so far as well. I, I also like Leafeon, though, just for the typing. All right, next one I think might is probably the worst one, <laughs> is Espeon. I'm really sad because I think Espeon is one of my favorites of the EVs. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the first attack, for, it's, this one actually costs three. Psychic Colors, Colors, 160, discard a random card for your opponent's hand. That is, like, useless. 
Uh, and then it's next attack. I'm like, why would I ever play this over just playing TM Devo? It takes three energies of different type to devolve each of your opponents of all Pokemon by shuffling the highest stage evolution back into their deck. So TM Devo puts it back in their hand. This one puts it in their deck. But this is yeah. so much setup for such a mediocre effect. Or it's a good effect, but you can literally get it on a card that costs one energy. Um, I don't yeah. know. Why would I, why would I ever play this? I, I don't know. Maybe there's a world where this is all right. Like, yeah, I think there's... You combine this with the Roxanne and shuffle like all the Curlias and Gardevoirs back in, I guess. I, I don't know. Like I'm just thinking real big picture here. Maybe there's a world where this could be decent. I think the fact that it goes back into their deck is probably not worth the two extra energies, or I guess one if we're not involving Crystal. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think I agree with you. I think this is pretty bad. But maybe I guess I could see your there. argument maybe against the evolution decks like Charizard or something. Like you shuffle if you keep spamming the attack, maybe you can like eventually yeah. run them out of candy or something. But because it uh, also doesn't I, have a drawback, right? Like, you can just keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like it'll die really quickly. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems mediocre to me. But, I mean, I've been wrong about a lot of cards before, so maybe. Um, uh, this card is already in Surging Sparks. It's the Sylveon. The one that its first attack is just 160, and then their defending Pokemon attack is 100 or less. And then the other attack is choose two of your bench, opponent's bench Pokemon, shuffle them back in. And um, you just can't use that attack back-to-back -back turns. Um... I mean, we'll talk about this, but we haven't really seen Sylveon see much play in Japan. Um, I mean, the effect is very strong. Like, I feel like eventually, like, there will be some type of control strategy that could use this. Um, I just don't know when. Or I just, I, I can't Sylveon see Sylveon GX a lot. Yeah, with Plea, Plea GX. Yeah, yeah. Put them back in the hand. I just don't think it's as strong as Sylveon GX was in that meta, right? Like, Sylveon GX is a very special place in that meta where... That effect was really strong at that time, but like now, I mean, I, I I agree with you. I hope it's I hope it's good in some sort of control variant just to see some sort of diversity. But I'm not super high on this one either. I don't know if I hope this is good. This is the type of card that's so annoying to play against if it's good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so okay, uh, last of the evolutions we have Umbreon. Um, okay, dark colors, colors, 160. Your opponent's active is not confused. That's whatever. And the next one is uh, Lightning Psychic Dark. Discard all energy from this Pokemon. Draw a prize card. Um, I mean, drawing prize cards is good. A, a lot of times you have to draw two prize cards at a time to, make, to be good. Uh, drawing one is kind of slow. But, you know, like late in the game sometimes, like decks could make like huge threats that you can't knock out. So just being able to circumvent that and just take a prize could be all yeah. right. I don't know. I cannot slow. overstate. Yeah, I cannot overstate the necessity of this card being bad. Like, this card has to be <laughs> bad, because if Umbreon is good, we have, we have some pricing problems coming in our future. So, I'm very happy this card is mediocre. Um, this is like a worse version of Slowbro, kind of. Um, so, I mean, this is a very costly attack. You're discarding all energies. As Karen said, you're drawing one prize card in the meta where everything is it's just boom, boom, boom. One application I can maybe see for this is like, yeah, like you said, you can use use it to draw your last prize card. Maybe you play a bunch of dust or something, and you kind of just yeah. like push the prize trade in the way that you want it to go. Um, but thankfully, it doesn't seem too promising, so our wallets will survive. Yeah, and then yeah, here's the EVX. Uh, you can play Pokemon EX that EX that evolve from EV on the Pokemon. You still have to wait a turn. Attack is yep. two hundred. So, uh, yeah, this card like isn't actually like good for attacking. It's literally just there to evolve. So, um. There was a couple of like trainers here, like there's this uh, girl, Amaris, I think they say her name. Draw four cards at the end of your turn. If you have five or more in your hand, discard your hand. Actually, a very interesting effect. I don't know if you've seen it something is. like that before. Um, draw three is just universally like not considered good enough. Draw four is like somewhat playable. We've seen cards like the Ace Trainer or Coach Trainer, the one with the tag teams at true four that saw play. Um, I mean, it's not that hard to make your hand less than five cards, so... Uh, aggressive decks you know could where, maybe uh, use this. But... Sorry, I was gonna say, you know where this card is gonna do uh, break a lot of hearts in uh, pre-release. People oh. are gonna be like, "Yo, draw four. This is sick." Then they're gonna draw four in their hand of four, and it's gonna be and four energies. energies yeah. or a bunch of unplayable mans. <laughs> they're <gonna just> <laughs> their whole hand. This card is gonna break some hearts, guys. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the other problem too, a lot of decks that want to play effects like draw four. Like there's some decks that play chorus experiment that aren't lost on decks. Because they don't want to reset their hand, they just want to keep adding to it. That's where effects yeah. like draw four is good. But I mean, this card just says like you can't do that. So I don't really know where this bad. card is going to see play. Um, I don't know. I feel like research is just better as drawing cards. Um, 
And then we have a Max Rod A spec. Choose up to five any combination of Pokemon and energy from your basic energy from your discard and put them in your hand. So it's basically Night Stretcher times five. Um, it's a very powerful effect, but it's competing with other powerful A specs. Um, so I don't know which deck could maybe make best use of this, really. Um, Am I wrong cool. in saying we just have too many A specs now? There's way too many A specs. Like, why do we have so many? Like, it just feels like, like they like this. Yeah, I think I've said this already. I think A specs is like a horrible mechanic. Uh, but yeah, I don't know why we have so many. Yeah, this doesn't make any sense to me. Like, y you can keep all these cards, all these effects for like future expansions. Like, your game is not dying. You don't need to like expel all these random effects into the universe. There's just no need for these cards. Like, you're literally just wasting paper. Everyone's gonna play Prime Catcher. Everyone's gonna pay play whatever like Secret Box, like just the better ones. And this is one of the ones where you can at least argue like maybe it has some effect to it. Yeah. But like, you're telling me that I needed to pull like five dangerous lasers in my packs for me to have a good life? Like, there's no way, man. Like, you just don't need a lot of these Ace packs. I feel like there's way yeah. some concepts here. Yeah, and there's also some more EV reprints. I think these are cards that already exist nice. uh, in the set as well. So. Um, cool. All right. Now, things finish off. We want to talk about just kind of our thoughts, maybe as Stellar Crown is coming. I know a lot of you guys aren't going to LAC. Uh, we may be going to Sacramento, Toronto Regionals. Um, so I've been really monitoring the city leagues. I have a lot of people who I work with who are um, not going to LAC. They just want to like kind of get ready for their tournaments. And my initial impression is that like Surging Sparks is changing almost nothing. Is what it seems like. Um, there's a couple of new archetypes. There's Cerulege, there is Arcaladon, there is Pikachu Blissey. Um, but other than that, I haven't seen anything like too crazy. Um, I don't really know if we're gonna see a tier one deck, a new tier one deck emerge, which I think is kind of sad to be honest. I feel like uh, Stellar Crown, it gave us Terrapagos, which is awesome. But other than that, it didn't really give us many new, new decks. Um, and I feel like we had Shrouded Fable, which didn't give us new decks, it just gave us broken cards. Um, so. Yeah, this is like I've yeah, it's cards, it's so. been a few sets since we've had a really like impactful one, right? Um, I think as we sit here and and talk about this every two and a half months or whenever sets get released, we always say take these with a grain of salt. Um, everything in North America or Europe and all around the world changes everything. In one region, uh, they they might not discover something. In another region, you do. Um, I think a perfect example is Raging Bolt Ogre Pond, which was virtually non-existent uh, in Japan for the most part. And it came to uh, America and Europe and South America, and suddenly we had the most broken archetype ever. So um, there's always room to to innovate with these things. Uh, when it comes to seeing Japan results and stuff, I think it's important to kind of have as a basis of your of your testing, but uh, definitely don't limit it. Uh, don't limit your testing to what you see. Yeah, I mean, I've been playing a bit. Um, I haven't tried the Ledge, Seru Ledge deck. I've tried the Blissey Pikachu deck, and I've tried the Arcaladon deck. They both feel like fine decks. I'm like, these could maybe be tier 2 decks in the right meta. They just don't feel like they have that much power. Um, right. Let's see if I can find one of the Arcaladon list. Because uh, it is a cool deck. Um, I was also playing it wrong at first. I was putting 3 energy when I evolved it instead of 2. So I was like, oh, this is actually like somewhat decent. And then I'm like, oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like, okay, I don't know why this list plays Luxray. But... <laughs> um, nice. You can play that Alga, which is that Alga is always good. I think the Alga has probably the most powerful V Star power or attack, like taking an extra turn. But you can play like Thornton and like you can just make the Alga out of nowhere and then like the Alga just like sweeps with Arcaladon. And, like you kinda use Arcaladon mm -hmm. as your early attacker, but uh 220 is just like not enough damage, I find. Uh and there are decks that can hit 300, right? Like Raging Bolt, it's not that hard to hit 300. Lugia plays Chinchino, it's not that hard to hit 300. Um, you're weak to fire. I know the attack takes away weakness, but like, like Charizard can just boss and like Radzard, like another Duraludon you have. Um, so the idea is to kind of like to be a tank deck. I just don't know if there's enough space in the meta game to be a tank deck yet. I think if this deck is going to be good, I think it needs to figure out how to exploit Dialga. That's just my opinion right now uh, on this this yeah. deck. So. Yeah, I think it's a good analysis of what's going on here. Like, there's a lot of a lot of space for growth. For sure. Yes. Um, and if you want one of these decks to go kind of crazy for you at a tournament, you're probably gonna need to innovate a little bit. So there's obviously a lot of a lot of new cards. Uh, we just don't know which ones are particularly great yet. 
We know it's yeah, really good. It's not great. I think uh, one deck that got... It hasn't been doing that great, but I thought I actually think it got buffed is I think uh, Maridon is doing a lot better now um, because they have the Magneton. And, like, they don't really care about giving up a prize because they're a two-prize deck. Uh, yeah. So Magneton is just kind of like, hey, like I can make two Iron Hands if I need to. Um, I'm kind of like, not Iono-proof, but like like very m much safer against it because I don't have to worry about all my energy getting taken off the board. Uh, like I'm clicking through all these city leagues, I cannot find him right on deck. There's not a single one. <laughs> Here's one. <laughs> um, wait, is this list okay? Yeah, they played Mag yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing Magneton. Uh, they play Area Zero with the you now they play Pikachu X and a Mewtwo X. Um, I can confidently say that Magneton and Pikachu together, like as their own deck, is not very good. Um, you just have to use Magneton too many times to give up too many prizes, and like you can't set up fast enough. Um. So I think Pikachu is going to be better as like in like Lost Zone, for example. It's like actually not bad. Uh, the Blissey deck is like decent. It struggles a little bit with Iono, but it is really cool. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to play on Pikachu. Like a lot of decks play Cologne, or you can play like uh, Raging Bull play Slitherwing. You can put like a damage counter on Pikachu ahead of time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, when Pikachu comes off, it, it just is really, really game changing, though, right? It's like you almost waste a whole turn. A lot of the time so i feel like uh it's one of those cards it's probably the card with the most potential but like time's gonna tell with these things and thankfully we have limitless warriors to solve the problems for us <laughs> Thank, yeah it'll be interesting when the warriors. set comes out on because it comes out on live i think when laic is happening if i'm correct or maybe even before that no i think it's earlier dude yeah yeah so before that so we'll have like limitless tournaments going on for the set and like all of us will be at laic like just playing the old format uh, yeah. and then well, it's actually kind of like, way earlier i think it comes out in like two days because the set is this out week? today for pre-release stores oh really yeah huh well, here's a hydrogen i haven't opened that's... a single pack but i think i'm gonna have to go buy one because there's a whooper promo i gotta go get, ah so. the whooper the whooper yeah so it's kind of interesting because like sacramento is the week after leic and i know a lot of players who are at leic have to go to sacramento so like they kind of have to do a quick pivot but yeah. I personally think that like the first like Sacramento, I think people are gonna play a lot of old archetypes since they like they haven't had time to like switch over. Yeah. Um, but then maybe like after that, like Toronto, for example, like we might have people trying to innovate more, and we might have uh, more of these being played. Bro, you're telling me they couldn't have just released this set one week earlier so we could have LAIC in a new format? Like this is some junk. I mean, thing. I don't think I think it's just the people who I think just TPCI scheduled LAIC at the wrong time. To be honest, <laughs> they goofed it, man. They goofed it. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not going to Sacramento, so I don't have to worry about it. But I have a lot of people who I work with who are like, oh, I'm like going to both. So it's like I have to. And then I like yeah. I have I have some people who are not going to LAC, so I have to be like up to date with like the new format. So I've been trying to keep up with both already. So, um, yeah, not too. Excited. And the other thing that's really sad to me is I haven't seen any slacking decks. Um, mm, yeah. Oh yeah, someone made top eight with Conkledor. Let's go. <laughs> oh, Uncle Dirk. Jesus. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll try and cook a slacking deck and uh, see if I can make it work. Otherwise, yeah, it just looks, be, guys, like if you have a favorite archetype right now, you can keep playing it. It'll probably still be yeah, good. I don't, I don't think there's anything major coming out of this, and if there is, you'd probably know by then anyway. Is Chen Pao um, Pidgeot in you? Chen Pao Pidgeot, very nice. <laughs> this is, uh, the, the, someone was just bored and dropped their binder on the floor. Nice. So, cool. All right. Uh, we don't have to bore everybody, but me just. Looking for the city league. So, do you have anything else you want to talk about before we we end it this week? Um, I'd like like to talk about the New York Giants, but I won't. The New because, York Giants. Uh, the New York Giants, I think, are in the most unfathomable position in pro sports. They they have a uh, multi million dollar quarterback who sucks, and uh, they have the most promising rookie in the league in Malik Neighbors, who is getting thrown to by Daniel Jones. And the team is two and six. Uh, they got rid of Saquon. They have no future, and they have one of the biggest fan bases. I guess maybe not because they're divided with the Jets, but they have a huge fan base in a big city. So, um, shout out to the New York Giants and their fans. Uh, Y'all are in my thoughts because you are down bad. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> nice. I'm sure we did a good job in leaving the sports talk to the end of the episode today. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah, I don't have much else to say other than like, like we could talk about the Vince Carter retirement ceremony, but that's uh we're gonna uncork a lot of can of worms there. So no, we're not talking about that. that. Uh okay, cool. Um yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Um yeah, Appreciate if you're if you're if you're at Argentina SP or Brazil or LAIC, come say hi. Uh, yeah. Um remember, I think most of all the take home message for today as we sign off, Drake is a waste man.
I agree. That we can agree Drake on. Drake is a waste man. Yeah, that, <laughs> guy's, that guy's a complete loser. I'm, I'm glad uh, Kendrick packed today, him up. <laughs> yeah, if you're bored today, just go stream the Not Like Us music video on repeat and leave your support comments in the in the uh, in the description. Uh, him him comments. trash talking DeRozan. Drake's dead to me. Bro, this done. guy is a complete lunatic. Yeah. I already hated him, and now this this was the nail in the coffin. If y'all yeah. don't know what we're talking about, look up the Drake DeRozan beef, and and you'll you'll get it. Anyways, y'all. Uh, we'll be back next week with an LAIC preview video as we go into the first big tournament of the year. Uh, stay tuned for that. And Drake is a waste man. Have a lovely week. <laughs> Later.